So in our last video, we discussed how the thoracic cage, which is this structure right here, is capable of moving to expand and contract, to increase and decrease the volume of the thoracic cavity, which is the space within the cage, which, is, which allows air to enter and exit the lungs. However, this bony structure can't move itself. It requires muscles for movements. And it's these muscles and the function of these muscles that we're going to talk about in this video. So the first of these muscles, which is arguably the most important, is the diaphragm. Now, if you've watched the Khan Academy video series on respiration, you know a bit about this diaphragm. So I'm just going to very quickly review it for you. But it's a really large muscle and it's attached to the margin of this thoracic cavity. It's attached to the costal margin, the sternum. It's attached to the posterior side of the thoracic cage. And then it expands up into the cavity to create domes. So you have your left and right domes of the diaphragm. So that's, this is all diaphragm. And when the diaphragm contracts, the domes of the diaphragm move down into the abdominal cavity. And this increases the volume of the thoracic cavity, allowing air to enter into the lungs. Now the other muscle that we're going to discuss, actually it's a, a group of three muscles, are the intercostals. Okay. And these three muscles run within the space between the ribs, and we're not going to go into too much detail about these muscles, but they have very specific orientations. And interestingly, you guys probably know something about these muscles if you're a fan of barbecue. So if you like eating short ribs or spare ribs, um, you like eating intercostal muscles. So next time you throw some on the barbecue, have a look. Now these muscles are actually pretty interesting because there's a bit of a debate about their true function. Uh, so some textbooks will tell you that when parts of these muscles ex contract, they'll help expand the rib cage by reducing the distance between the ribs or contracting the rib cage back down to its original size. However, there are some textbooks that tell you that the true function of these muscles is to prevent the lungs, which are these balloon-like structures within the thoracic cavity from ballooning out in the space between the ribs. Okay, so when the intercostals contract during respiration, they prevent this ballooning effect of the lungs. In reality, uh, the intercostals probably do both. Uh, they probably both prevent moving, uh, ballooning of the lungs, and they allow for some movement of the ribs. Now, the intercostals plus the diaphragm together are said to be primary muscles of respiration. So what are primary muscles of respiration? Well, these are muscles, muscles again like the diaphragm and the intercostals, whose function, whose main function, is in respiration. Now if they're primary muscles, that suggests there must be secondary muscles of respiration. And indeed there are secondary muscles of respiration. Now these are muscles whose function isn't just in respiration. So these secondary muscles have an accessory function. They can help in respiration, but their true function is in something else. And what are these muscles? So these are muscles uh, that are attached somewhere around the rib cage. And normally, their role is to move the upper limb. So I'm going to show you one example of these muscles. So here I'm drawing uh, just the upper part of the upper limb. And one of these secondary muscles of respiration is pec major. And this is a large muscle, particularly if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. So it's attached to the sternum, attached to the rib cage, and then it goes on to attach the upper part of the arm. Okay, So all of this is pec. And what does pec do? Well, normally it uses the thoracic cage as a base from which to contract from. 
in order to move uh, the arm. However, it's possible uh, for the reverse to happen in that pec major can use the arm to contract from in order to expand the thoracic cage. And you guys probably subconsciously know all about this actually. So suppose you go and run 400 meters. Here's a little sketch of me having just run 400 meters. So I'm exhausted. Right, that's my tongue. I'm panting. And what do you do after you finish 400 meters? Well, you're probably, like me, doubled over in pain, uh, grabbing onto a bench, or here I'm grabbed onto a fence. And what you're doing when you, when you do this is that you're fixing your upper limbs subconsciously. Therefore, you're fixing attachments of muscles like pec major, which are normally attached to the upper limb, and this allows the other end of the muscle to move. Okay? This is allowing pec major to pull on that thoracic cage to expand the volume of the cage. So if we put all this together, we can think of respiration really as a spectrum of muscle activity. Okay, so here's our our spectrum. At one end we're very active, the other end we're resting. Now when you're resting, just sitting around watching TV, you're for the most part just using your primary respiratory muscles. Largely just the diaphragm. Now with increasing activity, you recruit more and more of these primary muscles your diaphragm contracts to a greater extent uh, to increase the volume of this thoracic cavity. Uh, eventually, you start recruiting secondary muscles. Muscles like pec major to help change the volume of this thoracic cavity. So just sitting here watching this, this video, unless you're really hot and bothered and excited by the sound of my voice, you're just using your primary muscles of respiration. You're just using your diaphragm. Now, what I just told you about is largely just during inspiration. Inspiration involves all of these muscles. What about expiration? Removing air from the lungs. Well, this is mostly passive. You don't really need muscle for this. So I'd recommend going and watching the Khan Academy video videos on respiration. So in these videos, they discuss this elastic uh, capacity of the lungs. So the lungs are filled with this elastic tissue and they want to contract back to their original size after being filled with all this air. Now, you can recruit muscles To help in this process of expiration, muscles like your abdominals, so here, here are your abdominals, drawn in a nice six pack. Uh, now we won't go into the details of this, but go, go away and have a think about how contraction of your abdominals, which are going to increase the pressure within the abdominal cavity, can help remove air from the lungs. But expiration is largely passive, and when the lungs contract back to their original size, they take the rib cage passively with them. So the rib cage contracts back to its original size and shape. This suggests that the lungs and the inside of the ribs must be attached somehow. And they are, but it's not a firm attachment. Um, it's a rather interesting relationship between the lungs and the inside of the rib cage, and it's very clinically uh, relevant. And it's this relationship between the lungs and the inside of the ribcage that we'll talk about in the last of our videos.